Chapter forty eight of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Chapter forty eight, part one. Embedding of the remains of man and his works in subaqueous strata drifting of human bodies to the sea by river inundations destruction of bridges and houses loss of lives by shipwreck how human corpses may be preserved in recent deposits number of wrecked vessels fossil skeletons of men fossil canoes ships and works of art chemical changes which metallic articles have undergone after long submergence embedding of cities and forests in subaqueous strata by subsidence earthquake of kutch in eighteen nineteen buried temples of kashmir berkeley's arguments for the recent date of the creation of man concluding remarks i shall now proceed to inquire in what manner the mortal remains of man and the works of his hands may be permanently preserved in subaqueous strata of the many hundred million human beings which perish in the course of every century on the land every vestige is usually destroyed in the course of a few thousand years but of the smaller number that perish in the waters a certain proportion must be entombed under circumstances that may enable parts of them to endure throughout entire geological epochs the bodies of men together with those of the inferior animals are occasionally washed down during river inundations into seas and lakes belzoni witnessed a flood on the nile in september eighteen eighteen where although the river rose only three feet and a half above its ordinary level several villages with some hundreds of men women and children were swept away it was before mentioned that a rise of six feet of water in the ganges in seventeen sixty three was attended with a much greater loss of lives in the year seventeen seventy one when the inundations in the north of england appeared to have equalled the floods of morishire in eighteen twenty nine a great number of houses and their inhabitants were swept away by the rivers tyne can ware tees and greta and no less than twenty-one bridges were destroyed in the courses of these rivers at the village of bywell the flood tore the dead bodies and coffins out of the churchyard and bore them away together with many of the living inhabitants during the same tempest an immense number of cattle horses and sheep were also transported to the sea while the whole coast was covered with the wreck of ships four centuries before in thirteen thirty eight the same district had been visited by a similar continuance of heavy rains followed by disastrous floods and it is not improbable that these catastrophes may recur periodically though at uncertain intervals as the population increases and buildings and bridges are multiplied we must expect the loss of lives and property to augment fossilization of human bodies in the bed of the sea if to the hundreds of human bodies committed to the deep in the way of ordinary burial we add those of individuals lost by shipwrecks we shall find that in the course of a single year a great number of human remains are consigned to these subaqueous regions i shall hereafter advert to a calculation by which it appears that more than five hundred british vessels alone averaging each a burthen of about one hundred twenty tons are wrecked and sink to the bottom annually of these the crews for the most part escape although it sometimes happens that all perish 
in one great naval action several thousand individuals sometimes share a watery grave many of these corpses are instantly devoured by predaceous fish sometimes before they reach the bottom still more frequently when they rise again to the surface and float in a state of putrefaction many decompose on the floor of the ocean where no sediment is thrown down upon them but if they fall upon a reef where corals and shells are becoming agglutinated into a solid rock or subside where the delta of a river is advancing they may be preserved for an incalculable series of ages often at the distance of a few hundred feet from a coral reef where wrecks are not unfrequent there are no soundings at the depth of many hundred fathoms canoes merchant vessels and ships of war may have sunk and have been enveloped in such situations in calcarea sand and breccia detached by the breakers from the summit of a submarine mountain should a volcanic eruption happen to cover such remains with ashes and sand and a current of lava be afterwards poured over them the ships and human skeletons might remain uninjured beneath the superincumbent mass like the houses and works of art in the subterranean cities of campania already many human remains may have been thus preserved beneath formations more than a thousand feet in thickness for in some volcanic archipelagos a period of thirty or forty centuries might well be supposed sufficient for such an accumulation it was stated that at the distance of about forty miles from the base of the delta of the ganges there is an elliptical space about fifteen miles in diameter where soundings of from one hundred to three hundred fathoms sometimes fail to reach the bottom as during the flood season the quantity of mud and sand poured by the great rivers into the bay of bengal is so great that the sea only recovers its transparency at the distance of sixty miles from the coast this depression must be gradually shoaling especially as during the monsoons the sea loaded with mud and sand is beaten back in that direction towards the delta now if a ship or human body sink to the bottom in such a spot it is by no means improbable that it may become buried under a depth of a thousand feet of sediment in the same number of years even on that part of the floor of the ocean to which no accession of drift matter is carried a part which probably constitutes at any given period by far the larger proportion of the whole submarine area there are circumstances accompanying a wreck which favor the conservation of skeletons for when the vessel fills suddenly with water especially in the night many persons are drowned between decks and in their cabins so that their bodies are prevented from rising again to the surface the vessel often strikes upon an uneven bottom and is overturned in which case the ballast consisting of sand shingle and rock or the cargo frequently composed of heavy and durable materials may be thrown down upon the carcasses in the case of ships of war cannon shot and other warlike stores may press down with their weight the timbers of the vessel as they decay and beneath these and the metallic substances the bones of man may be preserved number of wrecked vessels when we reflect on the number of curious monuments consigned to the bed of the ocean in the course of every naval war from the earliest times our conceptions are greatly raised respecting the multicity of lasting memorials which man is leaving of his labors during our last great struggle with france thirty-two of our ships of the line went to the bottom in the space of twenty-two years besides seven fifty-gun ships eighty-six frigates and a multitude of smaller vessels the navies of the other european powers france holland spain and denmark 
were almost annihilated during the same period so that the aggregate of their losses must have many times exceeded that of great britain in every one of these ships were batteries of cannon constructed of iron or brass whereof a great number had the dates and places of their manufacture inscribed upon them in letters cast in metal in each there were coins of copper silver and often many of gold capable of serving as valuable historical monuments in each were an infinite variety of instruments of the arts of war and peace many formed of materials such as glass and earthenware capable of lasting for indefinite ages when once removed from the mechanical action of the waves and buried under a mass of matter which may exclude the corroding action of sea-water the quantity moreover of timber which is conveyed from the land to the bed of the sea by the sinking of ships of a large size is enormous for it is computed that two thousand tons of wood are required for the building of one seventy-four gun ship and reckoning fifty oaks of one hundred years growth to the acre it would require forty acres of oak forest to build one of these vessels it would be an error to imagine that the fury of war is more conducive than the peaceful spirit of commercial enterprise to the accumulation of wrecked vessels in the bed of the sea from an examination of lloyd's lists from the year seventeen ninety three to the commencement of eighteen twenty nine captain w h smith ascertained that the number of british vessels alone lost during that period amounted on an average to no less than one and a half daily an extent of loss which would hardly have been anticipated although we learn from moreau's tables that the number of merchant vessels employed at one time in the navigation of england and scotland amounts to about twenty thousand having one with another a mean burthen of one hundred twenty tons my friend mr j l prevost also informs me that on inspecting lloyd's list for the years eighteen twenty nine eighteen thirty and eighteen thirty one he finds that no less than one thousand nine hundred fifty three vessels were lost in those three years their average tonnage being about one hundred fifty tons or in all nearly three hundred thousand tons being at the enormous rate of one hundred thousand tons annually of the merchant vessels of one nation only this increased loss arises i presume from increasing activity in commerce out of five hundred fifty one ships of the royal navy lost to the country during the period above mentioned only one hundred sixty were taken or destroyed by the enemy the rest having either stranded or foundered or having been burnt by accident a striking proof that the dangers of our naval warfare however great may be far exceeded by the storm the shoal the lee shore and all the other perils of the deep durable nature of many of their contents millions of silver dollars and other coins have been sometimes submerged in a single ship and on these when they happen to be enveloped in a matrix capable of protecting them from chemical changes much information of historical interest will remain inscribed and endure for periods as indefinite as have the delicate markings of zoophytes or lapidified plants in some of the ancient secondary rocks in almost every large ship moreover there are some precious stones set in seals and other articles of use and ornament composed of the hardest substances in nature on which letters and various images are carved engravings which they may retain when included in subaqueous strata as long as a crystal preserves its natural form it was therefore a splendid boast that the deeds of the english chivalry at agincourt made henry's chronicle 
as rich with praise as is the ooze and bottom of the deep with sunken wreck and sumless treasuries for it is probable that a great number of monuments of the skill and industry of man will in the course of ages be collected together in the bed of the ocean than will exist at any one time on the surface of the continents if our species be of as recent a date as is generally supposed it will be vain to seek for the remains of man and the works of his hands embedded in submarine strata except in those regions where violent earthquakes are frequent and the alterations of relative level so great that the bed of the sea may have been converted into land within the historical era we need not despair however of the discovery of such monuments when those regions which have been peopled by man from the earliest ages and which are at the same time the principal theatres of volcanic action shall be examined by the joint skill of the antiquary and geologist power of human remains to resist decay there can be no doubt that human remains are as capable of resisting decay as are the harder parts of the inferior animals and i have already cited the remark of cuvier that in ancient fields of battle the bones of men have suffered as little decomposition as those of horses which were buried in the same grave in the delta of the ganges bones of men have been found in digging a well at the depth of ninety feet but as that river frequently shifts its course and fills up its ancient channels we are not called upon to suppose that these bodies are of extremely high antiquity or that they were buried when that part of the surrounding delta where they occur was first gained from the sea fossil skeletons of men several skeletons of men more or less mutilated have been found in the west indies on the northwest coast of the mainland of guadalupe in a kind of rock which is known to be forming daily and which consists of minute fragments of shells and corals encrusted with a calcareous cement resembling travertine by which also the different grains are bound together the lens shows that some of the fragments of coral composing this stone still retain the same red color which is seen in the reefs of living coral which surround the island the shells belong to species of the neighboring sea intermixed with some terrestrial kinds which now live on the island and among them is the bulimus guadalupensis of ferrosac the human skeletons still retain some of their animal matter and all their phosphate of lime one of them of which the head is wanting may now be seen in the british museum and another in the royal cabinet at paris according to m koenig the rock in which the former is enclosed is harder under the mason's saw and chisel than statuary marble it is described as forming a kind of glossus probably an indurated beach which slants from the steep cliffs of the island to the sea and is nearly all submerged at high tide similar formations are in progress in the whole of the west indian archipelago and they have greatly extended the plain of Cays in san domingo where fragments of vases and other human works have been found at a depth of twenty feet in digging wells also near catania in sicily tools have been discovered in a rock somewhat similar buried ships canoes and works of art when a vessel is stranded in shallow water it usually becomes the nucleus of a sand-bank as has been exemplified in several of our harbours and this circumstance tends greatly to its preservation between the years seventeen eighty and seventeen ninety a vessel from purbeck laden with three hundred tons of stone struck on a shoal off the entrance of pool harbour and foundered the crew were saved but the vessel and cargo 
remains to this day at the bottom since that period the shoal at the entrance of the harbour has so extended itself in a westerly direction towards peveril point in purbeck that the navigable channel is thrown a mile nearer that point the cause is obvious the tidal current deposits the sediment with which it is charged around any object which checks its velocity matter also drifted along the bottom is arrested by any obstacle and accumulates round it just as the african sand winds before described raise a small hillock over the carcass of every dead camel exposed on the surface of the desert i before alluded to an ancient dutch vessel discovered in the deserted channel of the river rother in sussex of which the oak wood was much blackened but its texture unchanged the interior was filled with fluviatile silt as was also the case in regard to a vessel discovered in a former bed of the mercy and another disinterred where the st catherine docks are excavated in the alluvial plain of the thames in like manner many ships have been found preserved entire in modern strata formed by the silting up of estuaries along the southern shores of the baltic especially in pomerania between bromberg and nacle for example a vessel and two anchors in a very perfect state were dug up far from the sea several vessels have been lately detected half buried in the delta of the indus in the numerous deserted branches of that river far from where the stream now flows one of these was found near vicar in Sinde, was four hundred tons in burthen old-fashioned and pierced for fourteen guns and in a region where it had been matter of dispute whether the indus had ever been navigable by large vessels at the mouth of a river in nova scotia a schooner of thirty-two tons laden with livestock was lying with her side to the tide when the bore or tidal wave which raises there about ten feet in perpendicular height rushed into the estuary and overturned the vessel so that it instantly disappeared after the tide had ebbed the schooner was so totally buried in the sand that the taffrail or upper rail over the stern was alone visible we are informed by lee that on draining martin mere a lake eighteen miles in circumference in lancashire a bed of marl was laid dry wherein no fewer than eight canoes were found embedded in figure and dimensions they were not unlike those now used in america in a morass about nine miles distant from this mere a whetstone and an axe of mixed metal were dug up in ayrshire also three canoes were found in loch doon some few years ago and during the year eighteen thirty one four others each hewn out of separate oak trees they were twenty-three feet in length two and a half in depth and nearly four feet in breadth at the stern in the mud which filled one of them was found a war club of oak and a stone battle-axe a canoe of oak was also found in eighteen twenty in peat overlying the shell marl of the loch of kinnordy in forfarshire end of chapter forty eight part one chapter forty eight of principles of geology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah principles of geology by charles lyle chapter forty eight part two manner in which ships may be preserved in a deep sea it is extremely possible that the submerged woodwork of ships which have sunk where the sea is two or three miles deep has undergone greater chemical changes in an equal space of time 
than in the cases above mentioned for the experiments of scoresby show that wood may at certain depths be impregnated in a single hour with salt water so that its specific gravity is entirely altered it may often happen that hot springs charged with carbonate of lime silex and other mineral ingredients may issue at great depths in which case every pore of the vegetable tissue may be injected with the lapidifying liquid whether calcareous or silicious before the smallest decay commences the conversion also of wood into lignite is probably more rapid under enormous pressure but the change of the timber into lignite or coal would not prevent the original form of a ship from being distinguished for as we find in strata of the carboniferous era the bark of the hollow reed-like trees converted into coal and the central cavity filled with sandstone so might we trace the outline of a ship in coal while in the indurated mud sandstone or limestone filling the interior we might discover instruments of human art ballast consisting of rocks foreign to the rest of the stratum and other contents of the ship submerged metallic substances many of the metallic substances which fall into the waters probably lose in the course of ages the forms artificially imparted to them but under certain circumstances these may be preserved for indefinite periods the cannon enclosed in a calcareous rock drawn up from the delta of the rhone which is now in the museum at montpelier might probably have endured as long as the calcareous matrix but even if the metallic matter had been removed and had entered into new combinations still a mould of its original shape would have been left corresponding to those impressions of shells which we see in rocks from which all the carbonate of lime has been subtracted about the year seventeen seventy six says mr king some fishermen sweeping for anchors in the gulf stream a part of the sea near the downs drew up a very curious old swivel gun nearly eight feet in length the barrel which was about five feet long was of brass but the handle by which it was traversed was about three feet in length and the swivel and pivot on which it turned were of iron around these latter were formed incrustations of sand converted into a kind of stone of exceedingly strong texture and firmness whereas round the barrel of the gun except where it was near adjoining to the iron there were no such incrustations the greater part of it being clean and in good condition just as if it had still continued in use in the encrusting stone adhering to it on the outside were a number of shells and corallines just as they are often found in a fossil state these were all so strongly attached that it required as much force to separate them from the matrix as to break a fragment off any hard rock in the year seventeen forty five continues the same writer the fox man-of-war was stranded on the coast of east lothian and went to pieces about thirty-three years afterwards a violent storm laid bare a part of the wreck and threw up near the place several masses consisting of iron ropes and balls covered over with ochreous sand concreted and hardened into a kind of stone the substance of the rope was very little altered the consolidated sand retained perfect impressions of parts of an iron ring just as impressions of extraneous fossil bodies are found in various kinds of strata after a storm in the year eighteen twenty four which occasioned a considerable shifting of the sands near st andrews in scotland a gun-barrel of ancient construction was found 
which is conjectured to have belonged to one of the wrecked vessels of the spanish armada it is now in the museum of the antiquarian society of scotland and is encrusted over by a thin coating of sand the grains of which are cemented by brown ferruginous matter attached to this coating are fragments of various shells as of the common cardium maya etc many other examples are recorded of iron instruments taken up from the bed of the sea near the british coast encased by a thick coating of conglomerate consisting of pebbles and sand cemented by oxide of iron dr davy describes a bronze helmet of the antique grecian form taken up in 1825 from a shallow part of the sea between the citadel of corfu and the village of castratus both the interior and exterior of the helmet were partially encrusted with shells and a deposit of carbonate of lime the surface generally both under the incrustation and where freed from it was of a variegated color mottled with spots of green dirty white and red on minute inspection with a lens the green and red patches proved to consist of crystals of the red oxide and carbonate of copper and the dirty white chiefly of oxide of tin the mineralizing process says dr davy which has produced these new combinations has in general penetrated very little into the substance of the helmet the incrustation and rust removed the metal is found bright beneath in some places considerably corroded in others very slightly it proves on analysis to be copper alloyed with eighteen point five per cent of tin its color is that of our common brass and it possesses a considerable degree of flexibility it is a curious question he adds how the crystals were formed in the helmet and on the adhering calcareous deposit there being no reason to suppose deposition from solution are we not under the necessity of inferring that the mineralizing process depends on a small motion and separation of the particles of the original compound this motion may have been due to the operation of electrochemical powers which may have separated the different metals of the alloy effects of the subsidence of land in embedding cities and forests in subaqueous strata we have hitherto considered the transportation of plants and animals from the land by aqueous agents and their inhumation in lacustrine or submarine deposits and we may now inquire what tendency the subsidence of tracts of land may have to produce analogous effects several examples of the sinking down of buildings and portions of towns near the shore to various depths beneath the level of the sea during subterranean movements were before enumerated in treating of the changes brought about by inorganic causes the events alluded to were comprised within a brief portion of the historical period and confined to a small number of the regions of active volcanoes yet these authentic facts relating merely to the last century and a half gave indications of considerable changes in the physical geography of the globe and we are not to suppose that these were the only spots throughout the surrounding land and sea which suffered similar depressions if during the short period since south america has been colonized by europeans we have proof of alterations of level at the three principal ports on the western shores caleo valparaiso and conception we cannot for a moment suspect that these cities so distant from each other have been selected as the peculiar points where the desolating power of the earthquake has expended its chief fury on considering how small is the area occupied by the seaports of this disturbed region points where alone each slight change of the relative level of the sea and land can be recognized 
and reflecting on the proofs in our possession of the local revolutions that have happened on the site of each port within the last century and a half our conceptions must be greatly exalted respecting the magnitude of the alterations which the country between the andes and the sea may have undergone even in the course of the last six thousand years kutch earthquake the manner in which a large extent of surface may be submerged so that the terrestrial plants and animals may be embedded in subaqueous strata cannot be better illustrated than by the earthquake of kutch in eighteen nineteen before alluded to it is stated that for some years after that earthquake the withered tamarisks and other shrubs protruded their tops above the waves in parts of the lagoon formed by subsidence on the site of the village of sindri and its environs but after the flood of eighteen twenty six they were seen no longer every geologist will at once perceive that forests sunk by such subterranean movements may become embedded in subaqueous deposits both fluviatile and marine and the trees may still remain erect or sometimes the roots and part of the trunks may continue in their original position while the current may have broken off or leveled with the ground their upper stems and branches buildings how preserved under water some of the buildings which have at different times subsided beneath the level of the sea have been immediately covered up to a certain extent with strata of volcanic matter showered down upon them such was the case at tomboro in sambawa in the present century and at the site of the temple of serapis in the environs of puzuoli probably about the twelfth century the entrance of a river charged with sediment in the vicinity may still more frequently occasion the rapid envelopment of buildings in regularly stratified formations but if no foreign matter be introduced the buildings when once removed to a depth where the action of the waves is insensible and where no great current happens to flow may last for indefinite periods and be as durable as the floor of the ocean itself which may often be composed of the very same materials there is no reason to doubt the tradition mentioned by the classic writers that the submerged grecian towns of burra and hellas were seen under water and it has been already mentioned that different eye-witnesses have observed the houses of port royal at the bottom of the sea at intervals of eighty-eight one hundred one and one hundred forty-three years after the convulsion of sixteen ninety two buried temples of kashmir the celebrated valley of kashmir or kashmir in india situated at the southern foot of the himalaya range is about sixty miles in length and twenty in breadth surrounded by mountains which rise abruptly from the plain to the height of about five thousand feet in the cliffs of the river jhelum and its tributaries which traverse this beautiful valley strata consisting of fine clay sand soft sandstone pebbles and conglomerate are exposed to view they contain fresh-water shells of the genera limnius polydina and serena with land shells all of recent species and are precisely such deposits as would be formed if the whole valley were now converted into a great lake and if the numerous rivers and torrents descending from the surrounding mountains were allowed sufficient time to fill up the lake basin with fine sediment and gravel fragments of pottery met with at the depth of forty and fifty feet in this lacustrine formation show that the upper part of it at least has accumulated within the human epoch dr thomas thompson who visited kashmir in eighteen forty eight observes that several of the lakes which still exist in the great valley such as that near the town of kashmir 
five miles in diameter and some others are deeper than the adjoining river channels and may have been formed by subsidence during the numerous earthquakes which have convulsed that region in the course of the last two thousand years it is also probable that the freshwater strata seen to extend far and wide over the whole of kashmir originated not in one continuous sheet of water once occupying the entire valley but in many lakes of limited area formed and filled in succession among other proofs of such lake basins of moderate dimensions having once existed and having been converted into land at different periods dr thompson mentions that the ruins of avantapura not far from the modern village of that name stand on an older freshwater deposit at the base of the mountains and terminate abruptly towards the plain in a straight line such as admits of no other explanation than by supposing that the advance of the town in that direction was arrested by a lake now drained or represented only by a marsh in that neighborhood as very generally throughout kashmir the rivers run in channels or alluvial flats bounded by cliffs of lacustrine strata horizontally stratified and these strata form low table-lands from twenty to fifty feet high between the different watercourses on a table-land of this kind near avantapura portions of two buried temples are seen which have been partially explored by major cunningham who in eighteen forty seven discovered that in one of the buildings a magnificent colonnade of seventy-four pillars is preserved underground he exposed to view three of the pillars in a cavity still open all the architectural decorations below the level of the soil are as perfect and fresh-looking as when first executed the spacious quadrangle must have been silted up gradually at first for some unsightly alterations not in accordance with the general plan and style of architecture were detected evidently of subsequent date and such as could only have been required when the water and sediment had already gained a certain height in the interior of the temple this edifice is supposed to have been erected about the year eight hundred fifty of our era and was certainly submerged before the year fourteen sixteen when the mohammedan king sikandar called buchikan or the idol breaker destroyed all the images of hindu temples in kashmir farishta the historian particularly alludes to sikandar having demolished every kashmirian temple save one dedicated to mahadeva which escaped in consequence of its foundations being below the neighboring water the unharmed condition of the human-headed birds and other images in the buried edifice near avantapura leaves no doubt that they escaped the fury of the iconoclast by being under water and perhaps silted up before the date of his conquest berkeley's arguments for the recent date of the creation of man i cannot conclude this chapter without recalling to the reader's mind a memorable passage written by bishop berkeley a century ago in which he inferred on grounds which may be termed strictly geological the recent date of the creation of man to any one says he who considers that on digging into the earth such quantities of shells and in some places bones and horns of animals are found sound and entire after having lain there in all probability some thousands of years it should seem probable that guns metals and implements in metal or stone might have lasted entire buried underground forty or fifty thousand years if the world had been so old how comes it then to pass that no remains are found no antiquities of those numerous ages preceding the scripture accounts of time that no fragments of buildings no public monuments no intaglios cameos statues basso relievos medals 
inscriptions utensils or artificial works of any kind are ever discovered which may bear testimony to the existence of those mighty empires those successions of monarchs heroes and demigods for so many thousand years let us look forward and suppose ten or twenty thousand years to come during which time we will suppose that plagues famine wars and earthquakes shall have made great havoc in the world is it not highly probable that at the end of such a period pillars vases and statues now in being of granite or porphyry or jasper stones of such hardness as we know them to have lasted two thousand years above ground without any considerable alteration would bear record of these and past ages or that some of our current coins might then be dug up or old walls and the foundations of buildings show themselves as well as the shells and stones of the primeval world which are preserved down to our times that many signs of the agency of man would have lasted at least as long as the shells of the primeval world had our race been so ancient we may feel as fully persuaded as berkeley and we may anticipate with confidence that many edifices and implements of human workmanship and the skeletons of men and casts of the human form will continue to exist when a great part of the present mountains continents and seas have disappeared assuming the future duration of the planet to be indefinitely protracted we can foresee no limit to the perpetuation of some of the memorials of man which are continually entombed in the bowels of the earth or in the bed of the ocean unless we carry forward our views to a period sufficient to allow the various causes of change both igneous and aqueous to remodel more than once the entire crust of the earth one complete revolution will be inadequate to efface every monument of our existence for many works of art might enter again and again into the formations of successive eras and escape obliteration even though the very rocks in which they had been for ages embedded were destroyed just as pebbles included in the conglomerates of one epoch often contain the organized remains of beings which flourished during a prior era yet it is no less true as a late distinguished philosopher has declared that none of the works of a mortal being can be eternal they are in the first place wrested from the hands of man and lost as far as regards their subserviency to his use by the instrumentality of those very causes which place them in situations where they are enabled to endure for indefinite periods and even when they have been included in rocky strata when they have been made to enter as it were into the solid framework of the globe itself they must nevertheless eventually perish for every year some portion of the earth's crust is shattered by earthquakes or melted by volcanic fire or ground to dust by the moving waters on the surface the river of leth as bacon eloquently remarks runneth as well above ground as below end of chapter forty eight part two Chapter number forty nine of Principle of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emanuela. Principle of Geology by Charles Leal. Embedding of Aquatic Species in subaqueous strata inhumation of freshwater plants and animals shell marl fossilized seed vessel and stems of chara recent deposits in american lakes freshwater species drifted into seas and estuaries newell levels 
alternation of marine and freshwater strata, how caused, embedding of marine plants and animals, cetacea stranded on our shores, Littoral and estuary testacea swept into the deep sea. Burrowing shells. Living testacea found at considerable depths. Blending of organic remains of different ages. Having treated of the embedding of terrestrial plants and animals and of human remains in deposits now forming beneath the waters, I come next to consider in what manner aquatic species may be enthumed in strata formed in their own element. Freshwater plants and animals. The remains of species belonging to those genera of the animal and vegetable kingdoms, which are more or less exclusively confined to fresh water, are for the most part preserved in the beds of lakes or estuaries, but they are oftentimes swept down by rivers into the sea and there intermingled with the exuviae of marine races. The phenomena attending their inhumation in lacustrine deposits are sometimes revealed to our observation by the drainage of small lakes, such as are those in Scotland, which have been laid dry for the sake of obtaining shell mar for agricultural uses. In this recent formation, as seen in Forfarshire, Two or three beds of calcareous mar are sometimes observed separated from each other by layers of drift peat, sand or fissil clay. The mar often consists almost entirely of an aggregate of shells of the genera Limnea, Ranorbis, Valvata and Ciclas, of species now existing in Scotland. A considerable proportion of the testacea appear to have died very young, and few of the shells are of a size which indicates their having attained a state of maturity. The shells are sometimes entirely decomposed, forming a pulverant marl, sometimes in a state of good preservation. They are frequently intermixed with the stems of chari and other aquatic vegetables, the whole being matted together and compressed, forming lamine often as thin as paper fossilized seed vessels and stems of chara. As the chara is an aquatic plant which occurs frequently fossil informations of different eras and is often of much importance to the geologist in characterizing entire groups of strata, I shall describe the manner in which I have found the recent species in a petrified state. They occur in a marl lake in Forfarshire, enclosed in nodules, and sometimes in a continuous stratum of a kind of travertine. The seed vessel of these plants is remarkably thought and art, and consists of a membranous knot covered by an integument, both of which are spirally striated or ribbed. The integument is composed of five spiral valves of a quadrangular form. In Chara Ispida, which abounds in the lakes of Forfarshire, and which has become fossil in the Becky Lock. Each of the spiral valves of the seed vessel turns rather more than twice round the circumference, the whole together making between 10 and 11 rings. The number of these rings differs greatly in different species, but in the same appears to be very constant. The stems of chare occur fossil in the Scotch marl in great abundance. In some species, as in Chara Ispida, the plant, when living, contains so much carbonate of lime in its vegetable organization, independently of calcareous incrustation, that it effervesces strongly with acids when dry. The stems of Chara Ispida are longitudinally striated, with a tendency to be spiral. This stria, as appears to be the case with all chare, turn always like the worm of a screw from right to left, while those of the seed vessel wind round in a contrary direction. A cross-section of the stem exhibits a curious structure, for it is composed of a large tube surrounded by smaller tubes, as is seen in some extincts as well as recent species. In the stems of several species, however, there is only a single tube.
The valves of a small animal called Cipris, Cipris ornata, occur completely fossilized, like the stems of Chare, in the scotch traveled in above mentioned. The same Cipris inhabits the lakes and ponds of England, where, together with many other species, it is not uncommon. Although extremely minute, they are visible to the naked eye, and may be observed in great numbers swimming swiftly through the waters of our stagnant pools and ditches. The antennae, at the end of which are fine pencils of air, are the principal organs for swimming, and are moved with great rapidity. The animal resides within two small valves, not unlike those of a bivalve shell, and molds its integuments annually, which the conchiferous mollusks do not. The cast-off shells, resembling thin scales and occurring in countless myriads in many ancient freshwater mars, impart to them a divisional structure, like that so frequently derived from plates of mica. The recent strata of lacustrine origin above alluded to are of very small extent, but analogous deposits on the grandest scale are forming in the great Canadian lakes, as in Lake Superior and Huron, where beds of sand and clay are seen enclosing shells of existing species. The chara also plays the same part in the subaqueous vegetation of North America as in Europe. I observed along the borders of several freshwater lakes in the state of New York a luxuriant crop of this plant in clear water of moderate depth, rendering the bottom as verdant as a grassy meadow. Here, therefore, we may expect some of the toad seed vessels to be preserved in mud, just as we detect them fossil in the Eocene strata of Hampshire, or in the neighborhood of Paris and many other countries. Embedding of freshwater species in estuary and marine deposits. In US levels, we have sometimes an opportunity of examining the deposits which, within the historical period, have silted up some of our estuaries, and excavations made for wells and other purposes, where the sea has been finally excluded, enable us to observe the state of the organic remains in these tracts. The valley of the Ous between New Haven and New Is is one of several estuaries from which the sea has retired within the last seven or eight centuries. And here, as appears from the researches of Dr. Mantil, strata 30 feet and upwards in thickness have accumulated. At the top, beneath the vegetable soil, is a bed of peat about five feet thick, enclosing many trunks of trees. Next below is a stratum of blue clay containing freshwater shells of about nine species, such as now inhabits the district. Intermixed with this was observed the skeleton of a deer. Lower down, the layers of blue clay contain, with the above mentioned freshwater shells, several marine species well known to our coast. In the lowest beds, often at the depth of 36 feet, these marine testacea occur without the slightest intermixture of fluviatial species, and amongst them the skull of the narwhal, or sea unicorn, Monodon monoceros, has been detected. Underneath all these deposits is a bed of pipe clay, derived from the subjacent chalk. If we had no historical information respecting the former existence of an inlet of the sea in this valley and of its gradual obliteration, the inspection of the section above described would show, as clearly as a written chronicle, the following sequence of events. First, there was a saltwater estuary peopled for many years by species of marine testacea identical with those now living and into which some of the larger cetacea occasionally entered. Secondly, the inlet grew shallower, and the water became brackish, or, alternatively, salt and fresh, 
so that the remains of fresh water and marine shells were mingled in the blue argillaceous sediment of its bottom. Thirdly, the shoaling continued until the river water prevailed, so that it was no longer habitable by marine testacea, but fitted only for the abode of ruviatil species and aquatic insects. Fourthly, a peaty swamp or morass was formed, where some trees grew, or perhaps were drifted during floods, and where terrestrial quadrupeds were marred. Finally, the soil being flooded by the river only at distant intervals became a verdant meadow. In Delta of Ganges and Indus, it was before stated that on the sea coast in the Delta of the Ganges there are eight great openings each of which has evidently, at some ancient period, served in its turn as the principal channel of discharge. As the base of the delta is 200 miles in length, it must happen that, as often as the great volume of river water is thrown into the sea by a new mouth, the sea will at one point be converted from salt to fresh, and at another from fresh to salt, for with the exception of those parts where the principal discharge takes place, the salt water not only washes the base of the delta, but enters far into every creek and lagoon. It is evident, then, that repeated alternations of beds containing freshwater shells with others filled with marine exuviae may here be formed. It has also been shown by Arthesian borings at Calcutta that the delta once extended much farther than now into the gulf, and that the river is only recovering from the sea the ground which has been lost by subsidence at some former period. Analogous phenomena must sometimes be occasioned by such alternate elevation and depression as has occurred in modern times in the delta of the Indus. But the subterranean movements affect but a small number of the deltas formed at one period on the globe. Whereas the silting up of some of the arms of great rivers and the opening of others and the consequent variation of the points where the chief volume of their waters is discharged into the sea are phenomena common to almost every delta. The variety of species of testacea contained in the recent calcareous marl of Scotland, before mentioned, is very small, but the abundance of individuals extremely great, a circumstance very characteristic of freshwater formations in general, as compared to marine. For in the latter, as is seen on sea beaches, coral reefs, or in the bottom of the seas examined by dredging, Wherever the individual shells are exceedingly numerous, there rarely fails to be a vast variety of species. Embedding of the remains of marine plants and animals Marine plants The large banks of drift seaweed, which occur on each side of the equator in the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Oceans, were before alluded to. These, when they subside, may often produce considerable beds of vegetable matter. In Holland, submarine peat is derived from Fuci, and on parts of our own coast from Zostera Marina. In places where algae do not generate peat, they may nevertheless leave traces of their form imprinted on argillaceous and calcareous mud, as they are usually very thought in their texture. Seaweeds are often cast up in such abundance on our shores during heavy gales that we cannot doubt that occasionally vast numbers of them are embedded in littoral deposits now in progress. We learn from the researches of Dr. Forkhammer that besides supplying in common with land plants the material of coal, the algae must give rise to important chemical changes in the composition of strata in which they are embedded. These plants always contain sulfuric acid, and sometimes, in as large a quantity as 8.5%, combined with potash. Magnesia also and phosphoric acid 
are constant ingredients. Whenever large masses of seaweeds putrefy in contact with the ferruginous clay, sulfuret of iron, or iron pyrites, is formed by the union of the sulfur of the plants with the iron of the clay, while the potash, released from its union with the clay, idest silicate of alumina, forms with it a peculiar compound. Many of the mineral characteristics of ancient rocks, especially the alum slates and the pyrites which occur in clay slate, and the fragments of anthracite in marine silurian strata, may be explained by the decomposition of fucoids or sea wits. Embedding of cetacea It is not uncommon for the larger cetacea, which can float only in a considerable depth of water, to be carried during storms or high tides into estuaries or upon low shores, where, upon the retiring of high water, they are stranded. Thus, an arval, Monodon monoceros was found on the beach near Boston in Lincolnshire in the year 1800, the whole of its body buried in the mud. A fisherman, going to his boat, saw the horn and tried to pull it out when the animal began to steer itself. An individual of the common whale, Balena mysticetus, which measured 70 feet, came ashore near Peterhead in 1682. Many individuals of the genus Balenoptera have met the same fate. It will be sufficient to refer to those cast on shore near Burnt Island and Ataloa, recorded by Sibbald and the Nail. The other individual mentioned by Sibbald as having come ashore at Boyne in Bedfordshire was probably a reserveback. Of the genus Catodon, Cachalot, Ray mentions a large one stranded on the west coast of Holland in 1598, and the fact is also commemorated in the Dutch engraving of the time of much merit. Sibald II records that at a herd of Cachalots, upwards of 100 in number, were found stranded at Kerston in Orkney. The dead bodies of the larger cetacea are sometimes found floating on the surface of the waters, as was the case with the immense whale exhibited in London in 1831, and the carcass of a sicko or lamantine, Halicora, was, in 1785, cast ashore near Leith. To some accident of this kind, we may refer the position of the skeleton of a whale, 73 feet long, which was found at Air 3, on the 4th, near Stirling, embedded in clay 20 feet higher than the surface of the highest tide of the river Forth at the present day. From the situation of the Roman station and causeways at a small distance from the spot, it is concluded that the whale must have been stranded there at a period prior to the Christian era. Other fossil remains of this class have also been found in estuaries known to have been silted up in recent times, one example of which has been already mentioned as Lewis in success. Marine reptiles Some singular fossils have lately been discovered in the island of Ascension, in a stone said to be continually forming on the beach, where the waves threw up small rounded fragments of shells and corals which, in the course of time, become firmly agglutinated together and constitute a stone used largely for building and making lime. In a quarry on the northwest side of the island, about 100 yards from the sea, some fossil eggs of turtles have been discovered in the hard rock thus formed. The eggs must have been nearly hatched at the time when they perished, for the bones of the young turtle are seen in the interior, with their shape fully developed the interstices between the bones being entirely filled with grains of sand, which are cemented together, so that when the egg shells are removed, perfect casts of their form remain in stone. In the single specimen here figured, which is only five inches in its longest diameter, no less than seven eggs are preserved. 
To explain the state in which they occur fossil, it seems necessary to suppose that after the eggs were almost hatched in the warm sand, a great wave threw upon them so much more sand as to prevent the rays of the sun from penetrating, so that the yolk was chilled and deprived of vitality. The shells were, perhaps, slightly broken at the same time, so that small grains of sand might gradually be introduced into the interior by water as it percolated through the beach. Marine Testacea The aquatic animals and plants which inhabited the estuary are liable, like the trees and land animals which people the alluvial plains of a great river, to be swept from time to time far into the deep. For, as a river is perpetually shifting its course and undermining a portion of its banks with the forests which cover them, so the marine current alters its direction from time to time, and burns away the banks of sand and mud against which it turns its force. These banks may consist in great measure of shells peculiar to shallow and sometimes brackish water, which may have been accumulating for centuries until at length they are carried away and spread out along the bottom of the sea, at a depth at which they could not have lived and multiplied. Thus, littoral and estuary shells are more frequently liable even then freshwater species, to be intermixed with the exuvial pelagic tribes. After the storm of February the 4th, 1831, when several vessels were wrecked in the estuary of the 4th, the current was directed against a bed of oysters with such force that great heaps of them were thrown alive upon the beach and remained above high water mark. I collected many of these oysters as also the common eatable whelks, Buccina, thrown up with them, and observed that, although still living, their shells were worn by the long attrition of sand which had passed over them as they lay in their native bed, and which had evidently not resulted from the mere action of the tempest by which they were cast ashore. From these facts, we learn that the union of the two parts of a bivalve shell does not prove that it has not been transported to a distance, and when we find shells worn, and with all their prominent parts rubbed off, they may still have been embedded where they grew. Burrowing shells It sometimes appears extraordinary, when we observe the violence of the breakers on our coast, and see the strength of the current in removing cliffs and sweeping out new channels, that many tender and fragile shells should inhabit the sea in the immediate vicinity of this turmoil. But a great number of the bivalve testacea, and many also of the turbinated univalves, burrow in sand or mud. The solen and the cardium, for example, which are usually found in shallow water near the shore, pierce through a soft bottom without injury to their shells, and the folas, can drill a cavity through mud of considerable hardness. The species of these and many other tribes can sink, when alarmed, with considerable rapidity, often to the depth of several feet, and can also penetrate upwards again to the surface, if a mass of matter be heaped upon them. The hurricane, therefore, may expand its fury in vain, and may sweep away even the upper part of banks of sand or mud, or may roll pebbles over them, and yet this testacea may remain below secure and uninjured. Shells become fossil at a considerable depth. I have already stated that, at the depth of 950 fathoms, between Gibraltar and Ceuta, Captain Smith found a gravelly bottom, with fragments of broken shells, carried tighter probably from the comparatively shallow parts of the neighboring straits through which a powerful current flows. Beds of shelly sand might here, in the course of ages, be accumulated several thousand feet thick. But without the aid of the drifting power of a current, shells may accumulate in the spot where they live and die. At great depths from the surface, if sediment be thrown down upon them, for even in our own colder latitudes, the depths at which living marine animals abound is very considerable, 
Captain Vidal ascertained, by soundings made off Torrey Island, on the northwest coast of Ireland, that crustacea, starfish, and testacea occurred at various depths between fifty and one hundred fathoms, and it drew up the Italia from the mud of Galway Bay in two hundred and thirty and two hundred and forty fathoms water. The same hydrographer discovered on the rock hole bank large quantities of shells at depths varying from forty five to one hundred and ninety fathoms. The shells were for the most part pulverized and evidently recent as they retained their colors. In the same region, a bed of fish bones was observed extending for two miles along the bottom of the sea in eighteen and ninety fathoms water. At the eastern extremity also of the rock hole bank, fish bones were met with mingled with pieces of fresh shell at the depth of two hundred and thirty five fathoms. Analogous formations are in progress in the submarine tracks extending from the Shetland Isles to the north of Ireland, wherever soundings can be procured. A continuous deposit of sand and mud, replete with broken and entire shells, echini, etc., has been traced for upwards of twenty miles to the eastward of the Faroe Islands, usually at a depth of from forty to one hundred fathoms. In one part of this tract, latitude 61 degrees 50, longitude 6 degrees 30, fish bones occur in extraordinary profusion, so that the lid cannot be drawn up without some vertebra being attached. This bone bed, as it was called by our surveyors, is three miles and a half in length and 45 fathoms under water and contains a few shells intermingled with the bones. In the British seas, the shells and other organic remains lie in soft mud or loose sand and gravel, whereas in the bed of the Adriatic, Donati found them frequently enclosed in stone of recent origin. This is precisely the difference in character which we might have expected to exist between the British marine formations now in progress and those of the Adriatic, for calcareous and other mineral springs abound in the Mediterranean and land adjoining, while they are almost entirely wanting in our own country. I have already adverted to the eight regions of different depths in the Aegean Sea, each characterized by a peculiar assemblance of shells, which have been described by Professor Forbes, who explored them by dredging. During his survey of the west coast of Africa, Captain Sir Belker found, by frequent soundings, between the 23rd and 20th degrees of north latitude, that the bottom of the sea, at the depth of from 20 to about 50 fathoms, consists of sand with a great intermixture of shells, often entire, but sometimes finally comminuted. Between the 11th and 9th degrees of north latitude, on the same coast, at soundings varying from 20 to about 80 fathoms, he brought up abundance of corals and shells mixed with sand. These also were in some parts entire, and in others worn and broken. In all these cases, it is only necessary that there should be some disposition of sedimentary matter, however minute, such as may be supplied by rivers draining a continent, or currents preying on a line of cliffs, in order that stratified formations, hundreds of feet in thickness, and replete with organic remains, should result in the course of ages. But although some deposits may thus extend continuously for a thousand miles or more near certain coasts, the greater part of the bed of the ocean, remote from continents and islands, may very probably receive at the same time no new accessions of drift matter, or sediment being intercepted by intervening hollows, and which a marine current must clear its waters as throughoutly as a turbid river in a lake. Erroneous theories in geology may be formed not only from overlooking the great extent of simultaneous deposits now in progress, but also from the assumption that such formations may be universal or coextensive with the bed of the ocean. 
we frequently observe on the sea beach very perfect specimens of fossil shells quite detached from the matrix which have been washed out of older formations constituting the sea cliffs they may be all of extinct species like the Oceania fresh water and marine shells strewed over the shores of Hampshire, yet when they become mingled with the shells of the present period and buried in the same deposits of mud and sand, they would appear, if appraised and examined by future geologists, to have been all of the same age. That such intermixture and blending of organic remains of different ages have actually taken place in former times is unquestionable, though the occurrence appears to be very local and exceptional. It is, however, a class of accidents more likely than almost any other to lead to serious anachronism in geological chronology. End of chapter 49 Recording by Emanuela Chapter 50, Part 1 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Formation of Coral Reefs. The powers of the organic creation in modifying the form and structure of the Earth's crust are most conspicuously displayed in the labors of the coral animals. We may compare the operation of these zoophytes in the ocean to the effects produced on a smaller scale upon the land by the plants which generate peat. In the case of the sphagnum, the upper part vegetates while the lower part is entering into a mineral mass, in which the traces of organization remain when life has entirely ceased. In corals, in like manner, the more durable materials of the generation that has passed away serve as the foundation on which the living animals continue to rear a similar structure. The stony part of the lameliform zoophyte may be likened to an internal skeleton for it is always more or less surrounded by a soft animal substance capable of expanding itself. Yet, when alarmed, it has the power of contracting and drawing itself almost entirely into the cells and hollows of the hard coral. Although oftentimes beautifully colored in their own element, the soft parts become, when taken from the sea, nothing more in appearance than a brown slime spread over the stony nucleus. The growth of these corals, which form reefs of solid stone, is entirely confined to the warmer regions of the globe, rarely extending beyond the tropics above two or three degrees, except under peculiar circumstances, as in the Bermuda Islands in latitude 32 degrees north, where the Atlantic is warmed by the Gulf Stream. The Pacific Ocean, throughout the space comprehended between the 30th parallels of latitude on each side of the equator, is extremely productive of coral, as also are the Arabian and Persian Gulfs. Coral is also abundant in the sea between the coast of Malabar and the island of Madagascar. Flinders describes a reef of coral on the east coast of New Holland as having a length of nearly 1,000 miles and as being, in one part, unbroken for a distance of 350 miles. Some groups of coral islands in the Pacific are from 1,100 to 1,200 miles in length by 300 or 400 in breadth as the dangerous archipelago, for example, and that called Radak by Kotzebue. But the islands within these spaces are always small points, and often very thinly sown. Of the numerous species of zoophytes, 
which are engaged in the production of coral banks, some of the most common belong to the Lamarckian genera, Astrea, Porites, Madrepora, Millepora, Caryophilia, and Meandrina. Rate of the Growth of Coral Very different opinions have been entertained in regard to the rate at which coral reefs increase. In Captain Beechey's late expedition to the Pacific, no positive information could be obtained of any channel having been filled up within a given period, and it seems established that several reefs had remained for more than half a century at about the same depth from the surface. Ehrenberg also questions the fact of channels and harbors having been closed up in the Red Sea by the rapid increase of coral limestone. He supposes the notion to have arisen from the circumstance of havens having been occasionally filled up in some places with coral sand, in others with large quantities of ballast of coral rock thrown down from vessels. The natives of the Bermuda Islands point out certain corals now growing in the sea, which, according to tradition, have been living in the same spots for centuries. It is supposed that some of them may be in age with the most ancient trees of Europe. Ehrenberg also observed single corals of the genera Meandrina and Favia, having a globular form, from six to nine feet in diameter, which must, he says, be of immense antiquity, probably several thousand years old so that a pharaoh may have looked upon these same individuals in the Red Sea. They certainly imply, as he remarks, that the reef on which they grow has increased at a very slow rate. After collecting more than one hundred species, he found none of them covered with parasitic zoophytes, nor any instance of a living coral growing on another living coral. To this repulsive power, which they exert whilst living, against all others of their own class, we owe the beautiful symmetry of some large meandrinae, and other species which adorn our museums. Yet Balani and Serpulae can attach themselves to living corals, and holes are excavated in them by Saxicavus mollusca. At the island called Tapoto, in the South Pacific, the anchor of a ship, wrecked about fifty years before, was observed in seven fathoms water, still preserving its original form, but entirely encrusted by coral. This fact would seem to imply a slow rate of augmentation, but to form a correct estimate of the average rate must be very difficult, since it must vary not only according to the species of coral, but according to the circumstances under which each species may be placed, such, for example, as the depth from the surface, the quantity of light, the temperature of the water, its freedom from sand and mud, or as the absence or presence of breakers, which is favorable to the growth of some kinds and is fatal to that of others. It should also be observed that the apparent stationary condition of some coral reefs, which, according to Beechey, have remained for centuries at the same depth under water, may be due to subsidence, the upward growth of the coral having been just sufficient to keep pace with the sinking of the solid foundation on which the zoophytes have built. We shall afterwards see how far this hypothesis is borne out by other evidence in the regions of annular reefs or atolls. In one of the Maldive islands, a coral reef, which, within a few years, existed on an islet bearing coconut trees, was found by Lieutenant Prentice, quote, entirely covered with live coral and madrepur, end quote. The natives stated that the islet had been washed away by a change in the currents, and it is clear that a coating of growing coral had been formed in a short time. 
experiments also of Dr. Allen on the east coast of Madagascar prove the possibility of coral growing to a thickness of three feet in about half a year, so that the rate of increase may, under favorable circumstances, be very far from slow. It must not be supposed that the calcareous masses, termed coral reefs, are exclusively the work of zoophytes. A great variety of shells, and among them some of the largest and heaviest of known species, contribute to augment the mass. In the South Pacific, great beds of oysters, mussels, pinnae marinae, camae or tridacnae, and other shells, cover in profusion almost every reef, and on the beach of coral islands are seen the shells of echini and broken fragments of crustaceous animals. Large shoals of fish are also discernible through the clear blue water, and their teeth and hard palates cannot fail to be often preserved, although their soft cartilaginous bones may decay. It was the opinion of the German naturalist Forster, in 1780, after his voyage round the world with Captain Cook, that coral animals had the power of building up steep and almost perpendicular walls from great depths in the sea, a notion afterwards adopted by Captain Flinders and others. But it is now very generally believed that these zoophytes cannot live in water of great depth. Mr. Darwin has come to the conclusion that those species which are most effective in the construction of reefs rarely flourish at a greater depth than twenty fathoms, or one hundred and twenty feet. In some lagoons, however, where the water is but little agitated, there are, according to Kotzebue, beds of living coral in 25 fathoms of water, or 150 feet. But these may perhaps have begun to live in shallower water, and may have been carried downwards by the subsidence of the reef. There are also various species of zoophytes, and among them some which are provided with calcareous as well as horny stems, which live in much deeper water even in some cases to a depth of 180 fathoms, but these do not appear to give origin to stony reefs. There is every variety of form in coral reefs, but the most remarkable and numerous in the Pacific consist of circular or oval strips of dry land, enclosing a shallow lake or lagoon of still water, in which zoophytes and mollusca abound. These annular reefs just raise themselves above the level of the sea and are surrounded by a deep and often unfathomable ocean. In the annexed cut, one of these circular islands is represented, just rising above the waves, covered with the coconut and other trees, and enclosing within a lagoon of tranquil water. This accompanying section will enable the reader to comprehend the usual form of such islands. Of thirty-two of these coral islands visited by Beechey in his voyage to the Pacific, twenty-nine had lagoons in their centers. The largest was thirty miles in diameter, and the smallest less than a mile. All were increasing their dimensions by the active operations of the lithophytes, which appeared to be gradually extending and bringing the immersed parts of their structure to the surface. The scene presented by these annular reefs is equally striking for its singularity and beauty. A strip of land a few hundred yards wide is covered by lofty coconut trees, above which is the blue vault of heaven. This band of verdure is bounded by a beach of glittering white sand, the outer margin of which is encircled with a ring of snow-white breakers, beyond which are the dark heaving waters of the ocean. The inner beach encloses the still clear water of the lagoon, resting in its greater part on white sand, 
and when illuminated by a vertical sun of the most vivid green. Certain species of zoophytes abound most in the lagoon, others on the exterior margin, where there is a great surf. The ocean, says Mr. Darwin, throwing its breakers on these outer shores, appears an invincible enemy, yet we see it resisted and even conquered by means which at first seem most weak and inefficient. No periods of repose are granted, and the long swell caused by the steady action of the trade wind never ceases. The breakers exceed in violence those of our temperate regions, and it is impossible to behold them without feeling a conviction that rocks of granite or quartz would ultimately yield and be demolished by such irresistible forces. Yet these low, insignificant coral islets stand and are victorious, for here another power, as antagonist to the former, takes part in the contest. The organic forces separate the atoms of carbonate of lime, one by one, from the foaming breakers, and unite them into a symmetrical structure. Myriads of architects are at work night and day, month after month, and we see their soft and gelatinous bodies, through the agency of the vital laws, conquering the great mechanical power of the waves of an ocean, which neither the art of man nor the inanimate works of nature could successfully resist. As the coral animals require to be continually immersed in salt water, they cannot rise themselves by their own efforts above the level of the lowest tides. The manner in which the reefs are converted into islands above the level of the sea is thus described by Camiso, a naturalist, who accompanied Kotzebue in his voyages. When the reef, says he, is of such a height that it remains almost dry at low water, the corals leave off building. Above this line, a continuous mass of solid stone is seen, composed of the shells of mollusks and ahini, with their broken-off prickles and fragments of coral, united by calcareous sand, produced by the pulverization of shells. The heat of the sun often penetrates the mass of stone when it is dry, so that it splits in many places, and the force of the waves is thereby enabled to separate and lift blocks of coral, frequently six feet long and three or four in thickness, and throw them upon the reef, by which means the ridge becomes at length so high that it is covered only during some seasons of the year by the spring tides. After this, the calcareous sand lies undisturbed, and offers to the seeds of trees and plants cast upon it by the waves a soil upon which they rapidly grow, to overshadow its dazzling white surface. Entire trunks of trees, which are carried by the rivers from other countries and islands, find here, at length, a resting place after their long wanderings. With these come some small animals, such as insects and lizards, as the first inhabitants. Even before the trees form a wood, the sea birds nestle here, stray land birds take refuge in the bushes, and, at a much later period, when the work has been long since completed, man appears and builds his hut on the fruitful soil. In the above description, the solid stone is stated to consist of shell and coral, united by sand but masses of very compact limestone are also found even the uppermost and newest parts of the reef, such as could only have been produced by chemical precipitation. Professor Agassiz also informs me that his observations on the Florida reefs, which confirm Darwin's theory of atolls to be mentioned in the sequel, have convinced him that large blocks are loosened, not by shrinkage in the sun's heat, as Camiso imagined, but by innumerable perforations of lithodomy and other boring testacea. 
the carbonate of lime may have been principally derived from the decomposition of corals and testacea, for when the animal matter undergoes putrefaction, the calcareous residuum must be set free under circumstances very favorable to precipitation, especially when there are other calcareous substances, such as shells and corals, on which it may be deposited. Thus, organic bodies may be enclosed in a solid cement and become portions of rocky masses. The width of the circular strip of dead coral forming the islands explored by Captain Beechey exceeded in no instance half a mile from the usual wash of the sea to the edge of the lagoon, and in general was only about three or four hundred yards. The depth of the lagoons is various. In some, entered by Captain Beechey, it was from twenty to thirty-eight fathoms. The two other peculiarities which are most characteristic of the annual reef or atoll are first that the strip of dead coral is invariably highest on the windward side, and secondly, that there is very generally an opening at some point in the reef, affording a narrow passage, often of considerable depth, from the sea into the lagoon. Maldive and Lacative Isles The chain of reefs and islets called the Maldives, situated in the Indian Ocean, to the southwest of Malabar, forms a chain 470 geographical miles in length, running due north and south, with an average breadth of about 50 miles. It is composed throughout of a series of circular assemblages of islets, all formed of coral, the larger groups being from 40 to 90 miles in their longest diameter. Captain Horsburg, whose chart of these islands is subjoined, states that outside of each circle of or atoll, as it is termed, there are coral reefs sometimes extending to the distance of two or three miles, beyond which there are no soundings at immense depth. But in the center of each atoll there is a lagoon from fifteen to forty-nine fathoms deep. In the channels between the atolls no soundings can usually be obtained at the depths of one hundred fifty or even two hundred and fifty fathoms. But during Captain Morrisby's survey, soundings were struck at 150 and 200 fathoms. The only instances, as yet known, of the bottom having been reached, either in the Indian or Pacific Oceans, in a space intervening between two separate and well-characterized atolls. The singularity in the form of the atolls of this archipelago consists in their being made up not of one continuous circular reef, but of a ring of small coral islets, sometimes more than a hundred in number, each of which is a miniature atoll in itself. In other words, a ring-shaped strip of coral surrounding a lagoon of salt water. To account for the origin of these, Mr. Darwin supposes the larger annual reef to have been broken up into a number of fragments, each of which acquired its peculiar configurations under the influence of causes similar to those to which the structure of the parent atoll has been due. Many of the minor rings are no less than three and even five miles in diameter, and some are situated in the midst of a principal lagoon, but this happens only in cases where the sea can enter freely through breaches in the outer or marginal reef. The rocks of the Maldives are composed of sandstone, formed of broken shells and corals, such as may be obtained in a loose state from the beach, and which is seen when exposed for a few days to the air to become hardened. The sandstone is sometimes observed to be an aggregate of broken shells, corals, pieces of wood, and shells of the coconut. The Lacative Islands run in the same line with the Maldives, on the north, as do the isles of the Cagos archipelago on the south. 
so that these may be continuations of the same chain of submerged mountains, crested in a similar manner by coral limestones. Origin of the circular form, not volcanic. The circular and oval shape of so many reefs, each having a lagoon in the center, and being surrounded on all sides by a deep ocean, naturally suggested the idea that they were nothing more than the crests of submarine volcanic craters, overgrown by coral. And this theory I myself advocated in the earlier editions of this work. Although I am now about to show that it must be abandoned, it may still be instructive to point out the grounds on which it was formerly embraced. In the first place, it had been remarked that there were many active volcanoes in the coral regions of the Pacific, and that in some places, as in Gambier's group, rocks composed of porous lava rise up in a lagoon bordered by a circular reef, just as the two cones of eruption, called the Kamenis, have made their appearance in the times of history within the circular gulf of Santorin. It was also observed that, as in South Shetland Barren Island, and others of volcanic origin, there is one narrow breach in the walls of the outer cone by which ships may enter a circular gulf. So, in like manner, there is often a single deep passage leading into the lagoon of a coral island, the lagoon itself seeming to represent the hollow or gulf just as the ring of dry coral recalls to our minds the rim of a volcanic crater. More lately, indeed, Mr. Darwin has shown that the numerous volcanic craters of the Galapagos archipelago in the Pacific have all of them, their southern sides the lowest, or in many cases quite broken down, so that if they were submerged and encrusted with coral, they would resemble true atolls in shape. Another argument, which I adduced when formerly defending this doctrine, was derived from Ehrenberg's statement that some banks of coral in the Red Sea were square, while many others were ribbon-like strips, with flat tops and without lagoons. Since, therefore, all the genera and many of the species of zoophytes in the Red Sea agreed with those which elsewhere construct lagoon islands. It followed that the stone-making zoophytes are not guided by their own instinct in the formation of annular reefs, but that this peculiar shape and the position of such reefs in the midst of a deep ocean must depend on the outline of the submarine bottom, which resembles nothing else in nature but the crater of a lofty submerged volcanic cone. The enormous size, it is true, of some atolls made it necessary for me to ascribe to the craters of many submarine volcanoes a magnitude which was startling and which had often been appealed to as a serious objection to the volcanic theory that so many of them were of the same height, or just level with the water, did not present a difficulty so long as we remained ignorant of the fact that the reef-building species do not grow at greater depth than twenty-five fathoms. End of chapter 50, part 1part 2 of principles of geology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org principles of geology by charles lyell formation of coral reefs part 2 may be explained by subsidence mr darwin after examining a variety of coral formations in different parts of the globe, was induced to reject the opinion that their shape represented the form of the original bottom, 
instead of admitting that the ring of dead coral rested on a circular or oval ridge of rock, or that the lagoon corresponded to a pre-existing cavity, he advanced a new opinion, which must, at first sight, seem paradoxical in the extreme, namely, that the lagoon is precisely in the place once occupied by the highest part of a mountainous island, or, in other cases, by the top of a shoal. The following is a brief sketch of the facts and arguments in favor of this new view. Besides those rings of dry coral which enclose lagoons, there are others having a similar form and structure which encircle lofty islands. On the latter kind is Varnicoru, celebrated on account of the shipwreck of La Perouse, where the coral reef runs at the distance of two or three miles from the shore, the channel between it and the land having a general depth of between two hundred and three hundred feet. This channel, therefore, is analogous to a lagoon, but with an island standing in the middle like a picture in its frame. In like manner, in Tahiti, we see a mountainous land with everywhere round its margin a lake, or zone of smooth salt water, separated from the ocean by an encircling reef of coral, on which a line of breakers is always foaming. So also New Caledonia, a long, narrow island east of New Holland, in which the rocks are granitic, is surrounded by a reef which runs for a length of four hundred miles. This reef encompasses not only the island itself, but a ridge of rocks which are prolonged in the same direction beneath the sea. No one, therefore, will contend for a moment that in this case the corals are based upon the rim of a volcanic crater, in the middle of which stands a mountain or island of granite. The Great Barrier Reef already mentioned as running parallel to the northeast coast of Australia for nearly 1,000 miles, is another most remarkable example of a long strip of coral running parallel to a coast. Its distance from the mainland varies from 20 to 70 miles, and the depth of the great arm of the sea, thus enclosed, is usually between 10 and 20 fathoms, but towards one end from forty to sixty. This great reef would extend much farther, according to Mr. Jukes, if the growth of coral were not prevented off the shores of New Guinea by a muddy bottom, caused by rivers charged with sediment, which flow from the southern coast of that great island. Two classes of reefs, therefore, have now been considered. First, the atoll, and secondly, the encircling and barrier reef, all agreeing perfectly in structure, and the sole difference lying in the absence in the case of the atoll of all land, and in the others the presence of land, bounded either by an encircling or a barrier reef. But there is still a third class of reefs, called by Mr. Darwin fringing reefs, which approach much nearer the land, than those of the encircling or barrier class, and which indeed so nearly touch the coast as to leave nothing in the intervening space resembling a lagoon. That these reefs are not attached quite close to the shore appears to be the result of two causes. First, that the water immediately adjoining the beach is rendered turbid by the surf, and therefore injurious to all zoophytes, and secondly, that the larger and efficient kinds only flourish on the outer edge amidst the breakers of the open sea. It will at once be conceded that there is so much analogy between the form and position of the strip of coral in the atoll and in the encircling and barrier reef, that no explanation can be satisfactory which does not include the whole. If we turn, in the first place, to the encircling and barrier reefs, and endeavor to explain 
how the zoophytes could have found a bottom on which to begin to build, we are met at once with a great difficulty. It is a general fact, long since remarked by Dampier, that high land and deep seas go together. In other words, steep mountains coming down abruptly to the seashore are generally continued with the same slope beneath the water. But where the reef, as at B and C at figure 118, is distant several miles from the steep coast, a line drawn perpendicularly downwards from its outer edges B.C. to the fundamental rock D.E., must descend to a depth exceeding by several thousand feet the limits at which the efficient stone-building corals can exist. For we have seen that they cease to grow in water which is more than 120 feet deep. That the original root immediately beneath the points B.C., is actually as far from the surface as DE is not merely inferred from Dampier's rule, but confirmed by the fact that, immediately outside the reef, soundings are either not met with at all, or only at enormous depths. In short, the ocean is as deep there as might have been anticipated in the neighborhood of a bold coast and it is obviously the presence of the coral alone which has given rise to the anomalous existence of shallow water on the reef and between it and the land. After studying in minute detail all the phenomena above described, Mr. Darwin has offered in explanation a theory now very generally adopted. The coral-forming polypi, he states, begin to build in water of a moderate depth, and while they are yet at work, the bottom of the sea subsides gradually, so that the foundation of their edifice is carried downwards at the same time that they are raising the superstructure. If, therefore, the rate of subsidence be not too rapid, the growing coral will continue to build up to the surface, the mass always gaining in height above its original base, but remaining in other respects in the same position. Not so with the land. Each inch lost is irreclaimably gone. As it sinks, the water gains foot by foot on the shore, till in many cases the highest peak of the original island disappears. What was before land is then occupied by the lagoon, the position of the encircling coral remaining unaltered, with the exception of a slight contraction of its dimensions. In this manner are encircling reefs and atolls produced, and in confirmation of his views, Mr. Darwin has pointed out examples which illustrate every intermediate state, from that of lofty islands, such as Otaheite, encircled by coral to that of Gambier's group, where a few peaks only of land rise out of a lagoon, and lastly, to the perfect atoll, having a lagoon several hundred feet deep, surrounded by a reef rising steeply from an unfathomed ocean. If we embrace these views, it is clear that in regions of growing coral a similar subsidence must give rise to barrier reefs along the shores of a continent. Thus suppose A, in figure 119, to represent the northeast portion of Australia, and B, C, the ancient level of the sea, when the coral reef D was formed. If the land sink, so that it is submerged more and more, the sea must at length stand at the level E, F. The reef, in the meantime, having been enlarged and raised to the point G. The distance between the shore F and the barrier reef G is now much greater than originally between the shore C and the reef D, and the longer the subsidence continues, this further will the coast of the mainland recede. When the first edition of this work appeared in 1831, 
several years before Mr. Darwin had investigated the facts on which his theory is founded, I had come to the opinion that the land was subsiding at the bottom of those parts of the Pacific where atolls are numerous, although I failed to perceive that such a subsidence, if conceded, would equally solve the enigma as to the form both of annular and barrier reefs. I shall cite the passage referred to, as published by me in 1831. It is a remarkable circumstance that there should be so vast an area in eastern Oceania, studded with minute islands, without one single spot where there is a wider extent of land than belongs to such islands as Otaheite, Ofhai, and a few others, which either have been or are still the seats of active volcanoes. If an equilibrium only were maintained between the upheaving and depressing force of earthquakes, large islands would very soon be formed in the Pacific, for, in that case, the growth of limestone, the flowing of lava, and the ejection of volcanic ashes would combine with the upheaving force to form new land. Suppose a shoal six hundred miles in length to sink fifteen feet, and then to remain unmoved for a thousand years. During that interval, the growing coral may again approach the surface. Then let the mass be re-elevated fifteen feet, so that the original reef is restored to its former position. In this case, the new coral formed since the first subsidence, will constitute an island six hundred miles long. An analogous result would have occurred if a lava current fifteen feet thick had overflowed the submerged reef. The absence, therefore, of more extensive tracts of land in the Pacific seems to show that the amount of subsidence of, by earthquakes exceeds in that quarter of the globe at present, the elevation due to the same cause. Another proof also of subsidence derived from the structure of atolls was pointed out by me in the following passage in all former editions. The low coral islands of the Pacific, says Captain Beachy, follow one general rule in having their windward side higher and more perfect than the other. At Gambia and Matilda Islands, this inequality is very conspicuous, the weather side of both being wooded, and of the former inhabited, while the other sides are from twenty to thirty feet under water, where, however, they may be perceived to be equally narrow and well defined. It is on the leeward side also that the entrances into the lagoons occur, and although they may sometimes be situated on a side that runs in the direction of the wind, as at Bow Island, yet there are none to windward. These observations of Captain Beachy accord with those which Captain Horsburgh and other hydrographers have made in regard to the coral islands of other seas. From this fortunate circumstance, ships can enter and sail out with ease, whereas, if the narrow inlets were to windward, vessels which once entered might not succeed for months in making their way out again. The well-known security of many of these harbors depends entirely on this fortunate peculiarity in their structure. In what manner is this singular conformation to be accounted for? The action of the waves is seen to be the cause of the superior elevation of some reefs on the windward sides, where sand and large masses of coral rock are thrown up by the breakers. But there is a variety of cases where this cause alone is inadequate to solve the problem. For reefs submerged at considerable depth, where the movements of the sea cannot exert much power, have Nevertheless, the same conformation, 
the leeward being much lower than the windward side. I am informed by Captain King that, on examining the reefs called Rowley Shoals, which lie off the northwest coast of Australia, where the east and west monsoons prevail alternately, he found the open side of one crescent-shaped reef, the imperious, turned to the east, and of other, the mermaid, turned to the west, while a third oval reef of the same group was entirely submerged. This want of conformity is exactly what we should expect where the winds vary periodically. It seems impossible to refer the phenomenon now under consideration to any original uniformity in the configuration of submarine volcanoes, on the summits of which we may suppose the coral reefs to grow. For although it is very common for craters to be broken down on one side only, we cannot imagine any cause that should breach them all in the same direction. But the difficulty will perhaps be removed if we call in another part of the volcanic agency, subsidence by earthquakes. Suppose the windward barrier to have been raised by the mechanical action of the waves to the height of two or three yards above the wall on the leeward side, and then the whole island to sink down a few fathoms. The appearances described would then be presented by the submerged reef. A repetition of such operations by the alternate elevation and depression of the same mass, an hypothesis strictly conformable to analogy, might produce still greater inequality in the two sides, especially as the violent efflux of the tide has probably a strong tendency to check the accumulation of the more tender corals on the leeward reef, while the action of the breakers contributes to raise the windward barrier. Previously to my adverting to the signs above enumerated of a downward movement in the bed of the ocean, Dr. McCulloch, Captain Beachy, and many other writers had shown that masses of recent coral had been laid dry at various heights above the sea level, both in the Red Sea, the islands of the Pacific, and in the East and West Indies. After describing 32 coral islands in the Pacific, Captain Beachy mentioned that they were all formed of living coral except one, which, although of coral formation, was raised about 70 or 80 feet above the level of the sea and was encompassed by a reef of living coral. It is called Elizabeth, or Henderson's Island, and is five miles in length by one in breadth. It has a flat surface and, on all sides except the north, is bounded by perpendicular cliffs about 50 feet high, composed entirely of dead coral, more or less porous, honeycombed at the surface, and hardening into a compact calcareous mass, which possesses the fracture of secondary limestone, and has a species of millipore interspersed through it. These cliffs are considerably undermined by the action of the waves, and some of them appear on the eve of precipitating their superincumbent weight into the sea. Those which are less injured in this way present no alternate ridges or indication of the different levels which the sea might have occupied at different periods, but a smooth surface, as if the island, which has probably been raised by volcanic agency, had been forced up by one great subterraneous convulsion. At the distance of a few hundred yards from this island, no bottom could be gained with two hundred fathoms of line. It will be seen from the annexed sketch communicated to me by Lieutenant Smith of the Blossom that the trees come down to the beach towards the center of the island, a break at first sight resembling the openings 
which usually lead into lagoons, but the trees stand on a steep slope, and no hollow of an ancient lagoon was perceived. Beechey also remarks that the surface of Henderson's island is flat, and that, in Queen Charlotte's island, one of the same group, but under water, there was no lagoon, the coral having grown up everywhere to one level. The probable cause of this obliteration of the central basin or lagoon will be considered in the sequel. That the bed of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, where atolls are frequent, must have been sinking for ages, might be inferred, says Mr. Darwin, from simply reflecting on two facts. First, that the efficient coral-building zoophytes do not flourish in the ocean at a greater depth than 120 feet, and secondly, that there are spaces occupying areas of many hundred thousand square miles where all the islands consist of coral, and yet none of which rise to a greater height than may be accounted for by the action of the winds and waves on broken and triturated coral. Were we to take for granted that the floor of the ocean had remained stationary from the time when the coral began to grow, we should be compelled to assume that an incredible number of submarine mountains of vast height, for the ocean is always deep and often unfathomable between the different atolls, had all come to within 120 feet of the surface and yet no one mountain had risen above water. But no sooner do we admit the theory of subsidence than this great difficulty vanishes. However varied may have been the altitude of different islands, or the separate peaks of particular mountain chains, all may have been reduced to one uniform level by the gradual submergence of the loftiest points and the additions made to the calcareous cappings of the less elevated summits as they subsided to great depths. OPENINGS INTO THE LAGOONS In the general description of atolls and encircling reefs, it was mentioned that there is almost always a deep, narrow passage opening into the lagoon, or into the still water between the reef and the shore which is kept open by the efflux of the sea as the tide goes down. The origin of this channel must, according to this theory of subsidence, before explained, be traced back to causes which were in action during the existence of the encircling reef, and, when an island or mountain top rose within it, for such a reef precedes the atoll in the order of formation. Now in those islands in the Pacific, which are large enough to feed small rivers, there is generally an opening or channel in the surrounding coral reef at the point where the stream of fresh water enters the sea. The depth of these channels rarely exceeds 25 feet, and they may be attributed, says Captain Beechey, to the aversion of the lysophytes to fresh water and to the probable absence of the mineral matter of which they construct their habitations. Mr. Darwin, however, has shown that mud at the bottom of river courses is far more influential than the freshness of the water in preventing the growth of the polypi, for the walls which enclose the openings are perpendicular and do not slant off gradually, as would be the case if the nature of the element presented the only obstacle to the increase of the coral-building animals. When a breach has thus been made in the reef, it will be prevented from closing up by the efflux of the sea at low tides, for it is sufficient that a reef should rise a few feet above low water mark to cause the waters to collect in the lagoon at high tide and when the sea falls, to rush out at one or more points, where the reef happens to be the lowest or weakest. This event is strictly analogous to that 
witnessed in our estuaries, where a body of salt water accumulated during the flow, issues with great velocity at the ebb of the tide, and scores out, or keeps open, a deep passage through the bar, which is almost always formed at the mouth of a river. At first, there are probably many openings, but the growth of the coral tends to obstruct all those which do not serve as the principal channels of discharge, so that their number is gradually reduced to a few, and often finally to one. The fact observed universally that the principal opening fronts a considerable valley in the encircled island, between the shores of which and the outer reef there is often deep water, scarcely leaves any doubt as to the real origin of the channel in all those countless atolls where the nucleus of land has vanished. End of chapter 50, part 2 Chapter 50, part 3 of Principles of Geology this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell Chapter 50 Formation of Coral Reefs Part 3 Size of Atolls and Barrier Reefs In regard to the dimensions of atolls, it was stated that some of the smallest observed by Beechey in the Pacific were only a mile in diameter. If their external slope under water equals upon an average an angle of 45 degrees, then would such an atoll at the depth of half a mile, or 2,640 feet, have a diameter of two miles. Hence, it would appear that there must be a tendency in every atoll to grow smaller, except in those cases where oscillations of level enlarge the base on which the coral grows by throwing down a talus of detrital matter all round the original cone of limestone. Bow Island is described by Captain Beechey as 70 miles in circumference and 30 in its greatest diameter, but we have seen that some of the Maldives are much larger. As the shore of an island or continent, which is subsiding, will recede from a coral reef at a slow or rapid rate, according as the surface of the land has a steep or gentle slope, we cannot measure the thickness of a coral by its distance from the coast. Yet, as a general rule, those reefs which are farthest from the land imply the greatest amount of subsidence. We learn from Flinders that the barrier reef of northeastern Australia is in some places 70 miles from the mainland, and it should seem that a calcareous formation is there in progress 1,000 miles long from north to south, with a breadth varying from 20 to 70 miles. It may not indeed be continuous over this vast area, for doubtless innumerable islands have been submerged one after another between the reef and mainland, like some which still remain, as, for example, Mary's Island, latitude 9 degrees and 54 minutes south. We are also told that some parts of the gulf, enclosed with a barrier, are 400 feet deep, so that the efficient rock-building corals cannot be growing there, and in other parts of it, islands appear encircled by reefs. It will follow, as one of the consequences of the theory already explained, that, provided the bottom of the sea does not sink too fast, to allow the zoophytes to build upwards at the same pace, the thickness of coral will be great in proportion to the rapidity of subsidence, so that if one area sinks two feet, while another sinks one, the mass of coral in the first area will be double that in the second. But the downward movement must in general have been very slow and uniform, or where intermittent, must have consisted of a great number of depressions, each of slight amount, 
Otherwise, the bottom of the sea would have been carried down faster than the corals could build upwards, and the islander continent would be permanently submerged, having reached a depth of 120 or 150 feet, at which the effective reef-constructing zoophytes cease to live. If, then, the subsidence required to account for all the existing atolls must have amounted to three or four thousand feet, or even sometimes more, we are brought to the conclusion that there has been a slow and gradual thinking to this enormous extent. Such an inference is perfectly in harmony with views which the grand scale of denudation, everywhere observable in the older rocks, has led geologists to adopt in reference to upward movements. They must also have been gradual and continuous throughout indefinite ages to allow the waves and currents of the ocean to operate with adequate power. The map constructed by Mr. Darwin to display, at one view, the geographical position of all the coral reefs throughout the globe is of the highest geological interest leading to splendid generalizations, when we have once embraced the theory that all atolls and barrier reefs indicate recent subsidence, while the presence of fringing reefs proves the land to be stationary or rising. These two classes of coral formations are depicted by different colors, and one of the striking facts brought to light by the same classification of coral formations is the absence of active volcanoes in the areas of subsidence and their frequent presence in the areas of elevation. The only supposed exception to this remarkable coincidence at the time when Mr. Darwin wrote, in 1842, was the volcano of Torres Strait at the northern point of Australia, placed on the borders of an area of subsidence but it has been since proved that this volcano has no existence. We see, therefore, an evident connection, first, between the bursting forth every now and then of volcanic matter through rents and fissures, and the expansion or forcing outwards of the earth's crust, and secondly, between a dormant and less energetic development of subterranean heat and an amount of subsidence sufficiently great to cause mountains to disappear over the broad face of the ocean, leaving only small and scattered lagoon islands, or groups of atolls, to indicate the spots where those mountains once stood. On a review of the differently colored reefs of the map alluded to, it will be seen that there are large spaces in which upheaval and others in which depression prevails, and there are placed alternately, while there are a few smaller areas where movements of oscillation occur. Thus, if we commence with the western shores of South America, between the summit of the Andes and the Pacific, a region of earthquakes and active volcanoes, we find signs of recent elevation, not attested indeed by coral formations, which are wanting there, but by upraised banks of marine shells. Then, proceeding westward, we traverse a deep ocean without islands until we come to a band of atolls and encircled islands, including the Dangerous and Society archipelagos, and constituting an area of subsidence more than 4,000 miles long and 600 broad. Still farther, in the same direction, we reach the chain of islands to which the New Hebrides, Solomon, and New Ireland belong, where fringing reefs and masses of elevated coral indicate another area of upheaval. Again, to the westward of the New Hebrides, we meet with the encircling reef of New Caledonia and the Great Australian Barrier, implying a second area of subsidence. The only objection deserving attention which has hitherto been advanced against the theory of atolls, as before explained, is that proposed by Mr. McLaren. On the outside, he observes, of coral reefs very highly inclined, 
no bottom is sometimes found with a line of 2,000 or 3,000 feet, and this is by no means a rare case. It follows that the reef ought to have this thickness, and Mr. Darwin's diagrams show that he understood it so. Now, if such masses of coral exist under the sea, they ought somewhere to be found on terra firma, for there is evidence that all the lands yet visited by geologists have been at one time submerged. But neither in the great volcanic chain, extending from Sumatra to Japan, nor in the West Indies, nor in any other region yet explored, has a bed or formation of coral even five hundred feet thick been discovered, so far as we know. When considering this objection, it is evident that the first question we have to deal with is whether geologists have not already discovered calcareous masses of the required thickness and structure, or precisely such as the upheaval of atolls might be expected to expose to view. We are called upon, in short, to make up our minds, both as to the internal composition of the rocks that must result from the growth of corals, whether in lagoon islands or barrier reefs, and the external shape which the reefs would retain when upraised gradually to a vast height, a task by no means so easy as Sam may imagine. If the reader has pictured to himself large masses of entire corals, piled one upon another for a thickness of several thousand feet, he unquestionably mistakes altogether the nature of the accumulations now in progress. In the first place, the strata at present forming very extensively over the bottom of the ocean, within such barrier reefs as those of Australia and New Caledonia, are known to consist chiefly of horizontal layers of calcareous sediment, while here and there an intermixture must occur of the detritus of granitic and other rocks brought down by rivers from the adjoining lands, or washed from sea cliffs by the waves and currents. Secondly, in regard to atolls, the stone-making polypifers grow most luxuriantly on the outer edge of the island, to a thickness of a few feet only. Beyond this margin, broken pieces of coral and calcareous sand are strewed by the breakers over a steep seaward slope, and as the subsidence continues, the next coating of live coral does not grow vertically over the first layer, but on a narrow annular space within it, the reef, as was before stated, constantly contracting its dimensions as it sinks. Thirdly, within the lagoon, the accumulation of calcareous matter is chiefly sedimentary, a kind of chalky mud derived from the decay of the softer corallines, with a mixture of calcareous sand swept by the winds and waves from the surrounding circular reef. Here and there, but only in partial clumps, are found living corals, which grow in the middle of lagoon and mixed with fine mud and sand, a great variety of shells and fragments of testacea and echinoderms. We owe to Lieutenant Nelson the discovery that in the Bermudas, the calcareous mud resulting from the decomposition of the softer corallines is absolutely undistinguishable when dried from the ordinary white chalk of Europe, and this mud is carried to great distances by currents and spread far and wide over the floor of the ocean. We also have opportunities of seeing in upraised atolls, such as Elizabeth Island, Tonga, and Hapai, which rise above the level of the sea to heights varying from 10 to 80 feet, that the rocks of which they consist do not differ in structure or in the state of preservation of their included zoophytes and shells from some of the oldest limestones known to the geologist. Captain Beachy remarks that the dead coral in Elizabeth Island is more or less porous and honeycombed at the surface, 
and hardening into a compact rock which has the fracture of secondary limestone. The island of Pulonias of Sumatra, which is about 3,000 feet high, is described by Dr. Jack as being overspread by coral and large shells of the Chama Tridacna gigas, which rest on quartzos and aronaceous rocks at various levels from the seacoast to the summit of the highest hills. The cliffs of the island of Timor in the Indian Ocean are composed, says Mr. Jukes, of a raised coral reef abounding in Astraea, Meandrina, and Porites, with shells of Strombus, Conus, Nerita, Arca, Pecten, Venus, and Lucina. On a ledge about 150 feet above the sea, a tridacna, or large clamshell, two feet across, was found bedded in the rock with closed walls, just as they are often seen in barrier reefs. This formation in the islands of Sandalwood, Sumbawa, Madura, and Java, where it is exposed in sea cliffs, was found to be from 200 to 300 feet thick, and is believed to ascend to much greater heights in the interior. It has usually the form of a chalk-like rock, white when broken, but in the weathered surface turning nearly black. It appears, therefore, premature to assert that there are no recent coral formations uplifted to great heights, for we are only beginning to be acquainted with the geological structure of the rocks of equatorial regions. Some of the upraised islands, such as Elizabeth and Queen Charlotte in the Pacific, although placed in regions of atolls, are described by Captain Beachy and others as flat-topped and exhibiting no traces of lagoons. In explanation of the fact, we may presume that, after they had been sinking for ages, the descending movement was relaxed, and while it was in the course of being converted into an ascending one, the ground remained for a long season almost stationary, in which case the corals within the lagoon would build up to the surface and reach the level already attained by those on the margin of the reef. In this manner, the lagoon would be effaced and the island acquire a flat summit. It may, however, be thought strange that many examples have not been noticed of fringing reefs uplifted above the level of the sea. Mr. Darwin, indeed, cites one instance where the reef preserved on dry land in the Mauritius is peculiar moat-like structure, but they ought, he says, to be of rare occurrence. For in the case of atolls or of barrier or fringing reefs, the characteristic outline must usually be destroyed by denudation as soon as the reef begins to rise since it is immediately exposed to the action of the breakers, and the large and conspicuous corals on the outer rim of the atoll or barrier are the first to be destroyed and to fall to the bottom of vertical and undermined cliffs. After slow and continued upheaval, a wreck alone can remain of the original reef. If, therefore, says Mr. Darwin, at some period as far in futurity as the secondary rocks are in the past, the bed of the Pacific with its atolls and barrier reefs should be converted into a continent, we may conceive that scarcely any or none of the existing reefs would be preserved, but only widely spread strata of calcareous matter derived from their wear and tear. When it is urged in support of the objection before stated, that the theory of atolls by subsidence implies the accumulation of calcareous formations 2,000 or 3,000 feet thick, it must be conceded that this estimate of the minimum density of the deposits is by no means exaggerated. On the contrary, when we consider that the space over which atolls are scattered in Polynesia and the Indian Oceans may be compared to the whole continent of Asia, we cannot but infer from analogy 
that the differences in level in so vast an area have amounted, antecedently to subsidence, to five thousand or even a greater number of feet. Whatever was the difference in height between the loftiest and lowest of the original mountains, or mountainous islands, on which the different atolls are based, that difference must represent the thickness of coral, which has now reduced all of them to one level. Flinders, therefore, by no means exaggerated the volume of the limestone, which he conceived to have been the work of coral animals. He was merely mistaken as to the manner in which they were enabled to build reefs in an unfathomed ocean. But is it reasonable to expect, after the waste caused by denudation, that calcareous masses, gradually upheaved in an open sea, should retain such vast thicknesses? Or may not the limestones of the Cretaceous and Oolithic epochs, which attain in the Alps and Pyrenees a density of 3,000 or 4,000 feet, and are, in great part, made up of coralline and shelly matter, present us with a true geological counterpart of the recent coral reefs of equatorial seas? Before we attach serious importance to arguments founded on negative evidence, and opposed to a theory which so admirably explains a great variety of complicated phenomena, we ought to remember that the upheaval to a height of 4,000 feet of atolls, in which the coralline limestone would be 4,000 feet thick, implies, first, a slow subsidence of 4,000 feet, and secondly, an elevation of the same amount. Even if the reverse or ascending movement began the instant the downward one ceased, we must allow a great lapse of ages for the accomplishment of the whole operation. We must also assume that at the commencement of the period in question the equatorial regions were as fitted as now for the support of reef-building zoophytes. This postulate would demand the continuance of a complicated variety of conditions throughout a much longer period than they are usually persistent in one place. To show the difficulty of speculating on the permanence of the geographical and climatical circumstances requisite for the growth of reef-building corals, we have only to state the fact that there are no reefs in the Atlantic, off the west coast of Africa, nor among the islands of the Gulf of Guinea, nor in St. Helena, Ascension, the Cape Verdes, or St. Paul. With the exception of Bermuda, there is not a single coral reef in the central expanse of the Atlantic, although in some parts the waves, as at Ascension, are charged to excess with calcareous matter. This capricious distribution of coral reefs is probably owing to the absence of fit stations for the reef-building polypifers, other organic beings in those regions obtaining in the great struggle for existence a mastery over them. Their absence, in whatever manner it be accounted for, should put us on our guard against expecting upraised reefs at all former geological epochs, similar to those now in progress. Lime, whence derived. Dr. McCulloch, in his System of Geology, Volume 1, page 219, expressed himself in favor of the theory of some of the earlier geologists that all limestones have originated in organized substances. If we examine, he says, the quantity of limestone in the primary strata, it will be found to bear a much smaller proportion to the silicious and argillaceous rocks than in the secondary, and this may have some connection with the rarity of testaceous animals in the ancient ocean. He further infers that in consequence of the operations of animals, the quantity of calcareous earth deposited in the form of mud or stone is always increasing, and that as the secondary series far exceeds the primary in this respect, 
so a third series may hereafter arise from the depths of the sea, which may exceed the last in the proportion of its calcareous strata. If these propositions went no further than to suggest that every particle of lime that now enters into the crust of the globe may possibly in its turn have been subservient to the purposes of life, by entering into the composition of organized bodies, I should not deem the speculation improbable. But when it is hinted that lime may be an animal product, combined by the powers of vitality from some simple elements, I can discover no sufficient grounds for such an hypothesis, and many facts militate against it. If a large pond be made in almost any soil, and filled with rainwater, it may usually become tenanted by testacea, for carbonate of lime is almost universally diffused in small quantities. But, if no calcareous matter be supplied by waters flowing from the surrounding high grounds, or by springs, no tufa or shell marl are formed. The thin shells of one generation of mollusks decompose, so that their elements afford nutriment to the succeeding races. And it is only where a stream enters a lake, which may introduce a fresh supply of calcareous matter, or where the lake is fed by springs, that shells accumulate and form marl. All the lakes in Forfarshire, which have produced deposits of shell marl, have been the sites of springs, which still evolve much carbonic acid and a small quantity of carbonate of lime. But there is no marl in Loch Fithi, near Forfar, where there are no springs, although that lake is surrounded by these calcareous deposits, and although, in every other respect, the site is favorable to the accumulation of aquatic testacea. We find those carrier which secrete the largest quantity of calcareous matter in their stems to abound near springs impregnated with carbonate of lime. We know that, if the common hen be deprived altogether of calcareous nutriment, the shells of her eggs will become of too slight a consistency to protect the contents, and some birds eat chalk greedily during the breeding season. If, on the other hand, we turn to the phenomena of inorganic nature, we observe that, in volcanic countries, there is an enormous evolution of carbonic acid, either free, in a gaseous form, or mixed with water, and the springs of such districts are usually impregnated with carbonate of lime in great abundance. No one who has travelled in Tuscany, through the region of extinct volcanoes and its confines, or who has seen the map constructed by Targioni, 1827, to show the principal sites of mineral springs, can doubt for a moment, that if this territory was submerged beneath the sea, it might supply materials for the most extensive coral reefs. The importance of these springs is not to be estimated by the magnitude of the rocks which they have thrown down on the slanting sides of hills, although of these alone large cities might be built, nor by a coating of travertine that covers the soil in some districts for miles in length. The greater part of the calcareous matter passes down in a state of solution to the sea, and in all countries the rivers, which flow from chalk and other marly and calcareous rocks, carry down vast quantities of lime into the ocean. Lime is also one of the component parts of ogit and other volcanic and hypogene minerals, and when these decompose, is set free, and may then find its way in a state of solution to the sea. The lime, therefore, contained generally in sea water, and secreted so plentifully by the testacea and corals of the Pacific, may have been derived either from springs rising up in the bed of the ocean, or from rivers fed by calcareous springs, 
or impregnated with lime derived from disintegrated rocks, both volcanic and hypogene. If this be admitted, the greater proportion of limestone in the more modern formations, as compared to the most ancient, will be explained, for springs in general hold no argillaceous and but a small quantity of siliceous matter in solution, but they are continually subtracting calcareous matter from the inferior rocks. The constant transfer, therefore, of carbonate of lime from the lower or older portions of the earth's crust to the surface must cause at all periods and throughout an indefinite succession of geological epochs a preponderance of calcareous matter in the newer as contrasted with the older formations. End of chapter 50Concluding Remarks of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Concluding Remarks. In the concluding chapters of the first book, I examined in detail a great variety of arguments which have been adduced to prove the distinctness of the state of the Earth's crust at remote and recent epochs. Among other supposed proofs of this distinctness, the dearth of calcareous matter in the ancient rocks above adverted to might have been considered. But it would have been endless to enumerate all the objections urged against those geologists who represent the course of nature at the earliest periods as resembling in all essential circumstances the state of things now established. We have seen that, in opposition to this doctrine, a strong desire has been manifested to discover in the ancient rocks the signs of an epoch when the planet was uninhabited, and when its surface was in a chaotic condition and uninhabitable. The opposite opinion, indeed, that the oldest of the rocks now visible may be the last monuments of an antecedent era in which living beings may already have peopled the land and water, has been declared to be equivalent to the assumption that there never was a beginning to the present order of things. With equal justice might an astronomer be accused of asserting that the works of creation extended throughout infinite space, because he refuses to take for granted that the remotest stars now seen in the heavens are on the utmost verge of the material universe. Every improvement of the telescope has brought thousands of new worlds into view, and it would therefore be rash and unphilosophical to imagine that we already survey the whole extent of the vast scheme, or that it will ever be brought within the sphere of human observation. But no argument can be drawn from such premises in favor of the infinity of the space that has been filled with worlds, and if the material universe has any limits, it then follows that it must occupy a minute and infinitesimal point in infinite space. So if, in tracing back the earth's history, we arrive at the monuments of events which may have happened millions of ages before our times, and if we still find no decided evidence of a commencement, yet the arguments from analogy in support of the probability of a beginning remain unshaken, and if the past duration of the earth be finite, then the aggregate of geological epochs, however numerous, must constitute a mere moment of the past, a mere infinitesimal portion of eternity. It has been argued that as the different states of the earth's surface and the different species by which it has been inhabited have all had their origin, and many of them their termination, so the entire series may have commenced at a certain period. It has also been urged that, as we admit the creation of man to have occurred at a comparatively modern epoch, as we can see the astonishing fact of the first introduction of a moral and intellectual being, so also we may conceive the first creation of the planet itself. I am far from denying the weight of this reasoning from analogy, but although it may strengthen our conviction that the present system of change has not gone on from eternity, it cannot warrant us in presuming that we shall be permitted to behold the signs of the earth's origin, or the evidences of the first introduction into it of organic beings. 
we aspire in vain to assign limits to the works of creation and space, whether we examine the starry heavens or that world of minute animacules which is revealed to us by the microscope. We are prepared, therefore, to find that in time also the confines of the universe lie beyond the reach of mortal ken. But in whatever direction we pursue our researches, whether in time or space, we discover everywhere the clear proofs of a creative intelligence and of his foresight, wisdom, and power. As geologists, we learn that it is not only the present condition of the globe which has been suited to the accommodation of myriads of living creatures, but that many former states also have been adapted to the organization and habits of prior races of beings. The disposition of the seas, continents, and islands, and the climates have varied. The species likewise have been changed, and yet they all have been so modeled on types analogous to those of existing plants and animals, as to indicate, throughout, a perfect harmony of design and unity of purpose. To assume that the evidence of the beginning or end of so vast a scheme lies within the reach of our philosophical inquiries, or even of our speculations, appears to be inconsistent with a just estimate of the relations which subsist between the finite powers of man and the attributes of an infinite and eternal being. End of concluding remarks. And end of Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell.